talking today, and thanks everybody who's actually staying till the very bitter end, um, about a, a science opportunities fund. I will do absolutely. Yeah, a science opportunities fund uh, project that we finished last year, and I'm going to be talking a little bit about the tool that we've developed and some of the plans that we have to implement that tool and why it was useful, and um, also. We're lucky enough to have an industry representative here to Gordon King from Taylor Shellfish, which is the biggest specific uh, shellfish operation. And so we're going to be kind of tag teaming it because I thought it's all very well for me to say a few things, but you might as well hear it from the horse's mouth, so to speak. <laughs> I hope you don't mind. <laughs> so um, these are the animals that we're actually talking about here. So this is a lovely bowl of mussels from an agriculture population, so great to eat, uh, very good for you, very high in omega-3 fatty acids, um, a sustainable source of protein if they're an agriculture source, but these animals can actually provide us with so much more information rather than just being something attractive to eat. So when we look at distribution of these species, because these are all in the, in the mitosis group, you'll see anywhere that there's a little little blue line, that this is where you can find these different types of species. So they are found in both coastal and estuarine systems, and they're also found in the northern and southern hemispheres as well, so they're quite the, the global beast. And one of the great things about that is that it makes them a great organism to use as potential bioindicator species. So these have been used a lot in the past as a model indicator for um, concentrations of heavy metals, for example, in pollution monitoring programs. And one of the good things as well is that they don't move. So it means that you have the ability to, um, well, easily catch them for one thing. <laughs> but it also means that it will tell you a lot of information about what's going on in their local area. And actually, there is in over 40 different countries currently for looking at um, coastal health. Um, assessment studies in, in terms of pollution. When we look at mussel agriculture worldwide, it's a significant agricultural organism um, with 1.6 billion US dollars. When you look at um, actual places where agriculture occurs in mussels, depending on where you are, um, it can have uh, a higher or, or lesser effect to the local communities. For example, you've probably heard over on Prince Edward Island, there's a lot of mussel agriculture out there. And it's very important because supporting the coastal economies. Um, down at the bottom here is in Galicia, which is in the northwest of Spain. And this is the town of Vigo, you can see in the, in the background. And what you see there is the little, the little black kind of grass in the middle. And so this is effectively the same as having mussel rafts sitting outside between Stanley Park and and uh, beyond. So it's really such a strong part of their cultural heritage and it's very <coughs> important to their coastal communities. And then we have um, uh, British Columbia um, where there's a lot of opportunities for um, shellfish agriculture to help support remote coastal communities and you have absolutely fantastic reach quality, so that helps too. So in terms of uh, muscle operations, this was supposed to be a Nice cookies and video. Not sure if it's going to run or not. No, I don't think it will. Anyway, this is how um, shellfish agriculture is normally um, conducted for mussels. So you have them on long lines, which are a couple of boys or buoys, like that, um, which from which um, the mussel lines are actually suspended. And so these animals are actually filtering water um, and all the other particulates that are associated with the water out of the water column. And they use that for, for growth, but it can also give us information on what's happening in the local environment. So, when we first started this project, it's kind of when I came here in 2007, and it's through some discussions we had with industry about some mass mortality events that they were seeing. And one thing is, you know, when you're walking on the beach, you're used to seeing shells on the beach, you don't think anything of it. But how many of those shells that you're seeing are actually related to? a natural occurrence, for example, like old age, and how many are actually related to um, a potential um, man-made disturbance or maybe a large environmental effect. And whilst, obviously, 
especially for an agriculture population, having a mass mortality event is very bad because that's you know, the sustainability of your business. If you have animals that have a, sh a lower amount of stress, so they're not actually dying, that's still going to be affecting the productivity of those systems. So you can ha have animals that have um, stunted growth, for example. But one of the problems is how to determine what stress is for shellfish. They don't tell us, unfortunately, they don't have any art of swimming behaviour. And often what we see is that they're either happily filtering away, or they're actually at the, at the stages approaching death, um, or it's even an empty shell. So one of the uh, tools that we decided to use was to look at functional genomics. You can use tools like histology and biochemical methods, but they'll either give you the product of just one gene, whereas we wanted to look at really the whole physiological function of the animal, which is why we wanted to use the, the microarray approach. Um, so this is just a little diagram of the rest of the stages in our project. Um, so we also start with the muscles, we start in there. Um, and one of the issues that we have is that there was so, so little genomic information that was actually available for these organisms that we had to do um, a few different stress experiments to create cDNA libraries um, so that we could um, increase the genomic resources that we had. So we actually did this for two different species of cultured mussels, which are Mytilus edulis and Mytilus gallicomitiatus. And what we did was very simple stress experiments over a range of environmental stresses. And then we looked at different tissues as well. Um, we sequenced some of these. And when we first started, there was probably only 35,000 ESTs available on NCBI. Uh, so it can, gives you some information on what little information was available on these organisms. And then obviously we had to get bioinformatics read to see um, whether those sequences had, had hits to, to known genes or not. Then we developed the microarray, which we've um, finished validating. And now we're using it to, to look at some of the issues we have with muscle populations. So um, we did a kind of bi-directional sequencing approach to try and maximize the amount of information we were going to get from these um, organisms. And we actually sequenced, well, we ended up with 35,000 ESTs, which is effectively doubling the amount of information that's out there when we started. So you can see how even a small project contributed quite a lot in terms of um, information. And then we did various different uh, bioinformatic uh, clustering analysis. We actually have a project website as well where all of this information is currently being held that we hope to open up to the public soon. So that has all the sequence information and all the different go terms for um, bioinformatic search results compared to other species. And this is kind of how our microarray looks on the left. So it's an oligo array, we just have to go with that for ease of facilitation with um, collaborations and also for changing it for swapping genes on and off. But it's a 15k oligo array, and as I mentioned, it's for two different species of marine mussels. When we look at the actual composition of what's on the array, approximately half of the, the array is composed of sequences that, we, that have an unknown function that seem to be involved in the stress response that came from our specific mountain sequences, which is the project sequences. And then about a third of the sequences um, are from um, known hits to known genes of known function um, from our sequences, and then 12% of the literature, and then we have the, the obvious controls on there too. So just in case you're not familiar with gene spring and uh, gene expression profile plots, what you have here is um, one species on the two bars on the left and another species on the two bars on the right. And what this is showing you is a time series for different tissues. So this is a control animal all the way through to 24 hours of stress. And basically the, the cooler colours denote low levels of gene expression. <coughs> you have the, the warmer colours which denote high levels of gene expression. And what you see here is, for example, if you follow one gene from control, you see a very high increase in what was a control gene um, in, when it's in, in a stress state, and vice versa 
might be more difficult to see because it's in the yellows, but you see some yellows going down here. So these are genes that were um, normally being um, expressed, then being down-regulated um, when it came to the stress being applied. And what we find is that there is actually slight differences between species responses and also tissue responses. So when we look here at the chart, you can see this is one of the species, this is the second of the species, and it's a clear kind of cluster of different layers. And this is very interesting that in a number of different points because it gives us information on what potentially might be a good species to grow where depending on different environmental conditions. But also from an evolutionary context, um, these two species can actually hybridize and produce viable offspring. So they're presumably very closely related, and yet we are seeing these differences. And then, um, similar to kind of Christie's uh, work as well, we looked at different tissues, and what we find is that there's specific tissue responses as well. So this is one tissue for both species, and then the second tissue for, uh, for both species as well. So although there's a difference in species effect, um, the tissues are actually working similarly um, for both species. So this is important for us in terms of looking for potential biomarker genes of uh, stress because we want to be um, sampling the right tissue. For example, a gill might be a great tissue for looking for an initial response, whereas um, a kind of accumulatory <coughs> organ like digestive gland might be better for looking at a long-term response. So um, we did a load of validations using qPCR analysis. So the validations are now complete on, the, on this project. So at the top here is a, a typical gene that's used often when you look at shellfish stress, which is HSP17. And um, you can see there's a clear pattern with, in terms of time responses. So this slide is really kind of intended to communicate that we are working on some papers at the moment. We only just finished this project probably in November, October, November of last year. And one of the things is that um, there's a potential patent application associated with this. So we're going to give you the information as soon as we can. This just gets tied up in the process. And so that also means in relation from the actual sequence data all the way through to the papers. But one of the things that we really want to do is now use this bright spot, the tool that we have. And for example, the different monitoring studies. So looking at some of the potential impacts of um, land resource usages, like you know, uh, pulp mills or for agricultural runoff, and also for wastewater management. So in November, we actually submitted a project to the Proof of Concept program in terms of implementing our microarray into uh, use for wastewater management. We were actually approached by Santec, who are very large and global wastewater management company. And one of the issues that they have is that they do all these various different processes. And they have a list of potential compounds of concern. And they're trying to work out what the actual biological relevance is of all of these compounds of concern. And at the moment, they only have um, uh, methods for looking at kind of long-term accumulatory responses. Whereas they're actually now trying to find a tool that they can use for kind of more immediate sensitive responses. So they're very interested in um, assessing whether the micro can be used for this. So it can then be used in major kind of cities like New York or San Diego. So we'll, we'll see. Fingers crossed that project works out. And we're also <coughs> talking with other UBC collaborators about uh, toxic genomics um, with the, um, Metro Vancouver and also looking at some of these issues associated with the chemical processes and, and again what the biological relevances are.